Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to register for today's webinar. And I want to just take this opportunity to thank our partner, Herc, for enabling us to bring this webinar to you today. As Brianna has mentioned, my name is Carl Freelove, and I'm the marketing manager for jobs.ec.uk. And we're a global careers website for the higher education sector. Um, we advertise around 1,000, uh, well, actually thousands of faculty positions uh, for over 875 universities worldwide, including universities in the UK, Europe, Asia Pacific, and beyond. So with academics becoming increasingly mobile, um, and more universities worldwide actively seeking those with international experience, at Jobs AC we can see that a world of opportunity exists for the global academic. So today's webinar is all about global academic careers and exploring international opportunities. So whether you're thinking about working overseas, or simply working for, looking for a new challenge, over the next 60 minutes, we hope to provide you with lots of useful information to help you really explore your options. And I guess the question we get uh, asked quite a lot is whether the, the grass is really greener on either side. Well, working abroad in any profession has its attractions, whether it's a warmer climate or better cost of living. But for academics, life overseas can be a little bit more tempting. So whether it's to fast track your career, expand your personal horizons, or foster long-term collaborations, Globalising your academic career does have lots of exciting benefits. Unfortunately, lots of academics are unaware of the opportunities available and how to capitalise on them. So we really hope to address this in this very webinar. Going global can also be a very big decision to make with lots of important things to consider before planning the move. And after all, it's not always easy to uproot oneself from, from your surroundings. So over the next uh, 60 minutes or so, as I said, we're going to pick some of these key benefits uh, and some of the things you need to consider to become a global academic. And we have two really good panelists on board. We have Professor Eugene Clark and Dr. Mitzi Walsh. Um, together, they're both very seasoned tra travelers who will share their in tips, insights, and experiences about finding global academic opportunities and also working and living overseas. So without further ado, I want to pass you over to our first panelist, Professor Eugene Clark. Now, Professor Eugene is a distinguished professor of law and a senior foreign expert within the College of Comparative Law at the China University of Political Science and Law in Beijing. Now, Professor Eugene's session is going to explore three areas. First of all, we're going to look at some of the benefits of working abroad, and then we're going to look at how to find those global opportunities. And finally, we'll, we'll spend some time looking at some different countries within the, within the Asia Pacific region that Professor Eugene has spent some time in. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to, to Professor Eugene Clark. All right, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Carl. It's uh, great to, to be able uh, to do this, and uh, I look forward particularly to any questions, and I hope that uh, what I say will be of uh, some benefit uh, and interest to everyone. Uh, one uh, thing uh, about uh, the uh, Working in a global environment, as you realize, life is a 24-7 existence. It's 5 o'clock in the morning here. So please forgive me if I sound a little bit sleepy, uh, because I am. Uh, this is not coming from Beijing. It's actually coming from Port Macquarie, a small coastal town four hours north of Sydney. Uh, I'll be heading back to Beijing at the start of March. Uh, but globalization is a reality today with uh, all universities and just to give you one statistic from Beijing, when I first started going there almost 20 years ago, it was unusual to see many foreign academics or even foreign students. Uh, today, China has uh, just surpassed Australia as the third most popular destination for international students. And as I walk around the campus now, uh, I see students from uh, all over the world. And in my classes as well, I have students uh, from almost every continent, uh, and it, it makes it an incredibly exciting place to teach uh, and work, and that's what I'll be talking about today. As indicated on the slide that's up there now, there are many pluses, I think, for an international academic career, and I feel so blessed to have had the experiences that I have coming originally from Kansas, and like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, uh, I got blown to other places too, and it's been an exciting journey, and it's certainly not Kansas. Uh, but I think uh, the, the best way to understand your own culture is to get out of that culture and to experience another culture. And I think it makes you realize both the strengths of, of your own culture plus uh, some of its weaknesses, and you get the excitement of learning another. 
uh, as universities themselves, as the word university suggests being universal, have more and more international students coming in. So to have faculty who also have uh, that international mindset, I think, is a huge plus to the university. It adds to faculty diversity and it, to me, particularly in the College of Comparative Law, to have discussions with lawyers from so many other countries. Uh, and you get a deeper understanding of really the kinds of issues you see uh, different perspectives and ways of doing things and I think uh, you see best practice and help develop best practice that's useful to other countries as well. Uh, it's a value to U.S. students. So many, every university has many students who increasingly want the international experience if they have faculty who have also uh, got that international experience that's very powerful as well too. Uh, and I think it's also those students who come to your university, if you've got background and understanding of their country, that can be very, very uh, powerful and make them feel warm and welcome uh, as well. Plus, there's many teaching and research opportunities. On the research side, uh, as shown on the slide here, I, I, again, in Australia at least, uh, there's many grant applications now want and require you to have an international partner uh, connected with that. Uh, even if they don't, that's a plus uh, so that uh, the research has greater impact uh, and you can bring in uh, those other perspectives. Obviously, uh, funding bodies, Asia Development Bank, UN, Fulbright, etc. lots of opportunities there. There's many consulting opportunities that have come my way because I have the familiarity with a particular country. You develop networks in government departments that are that can request uh, you uh, and and again the international networks can be huge in terms of opening up opportunities uh, for teaching research consulting and other things as well so if you uh, the other thing that I would mention and I'm going pretty quickly I apologize is that not only is it a benefit for you as an academic but really for your whole family I have two daughters both in one's 30 one's 27 and we've always had international students with us and I think uh, that has been such a benefit for them when we visited those students in their own country. Uh, it was like visiting their brother or sister. Uh, they were taken along to schools uh, uh, speaking uh, the, and the, their own uh, cultural intelligence. You've heard of EQ, emotional intelligence, but I think today a cultural intelligence, a sensitivity to and an interest in other cultures, knowing a bit of the language and customs is a huge plus for the entire family. Uh, both of our girls I have learned a little bit about foreign languages uh, and uh, particularly when they were young, they've established lifelong networks. Those students are virtually family members. You see there a picture of, of Gao Yautip, who was one of our students from Thailand. We went to her wedding. Uh, uh, her kids are like our grandkids, and uh, she's like a sister to our two girls, and it's been a wonderful opportunity. And finally, uh, on this slide, that uh, countries are increasingly realizing that, that that academics have dual careers, and I've always been impressed with how uh, the university that I've gone to has made an effort as well to find an opportunity for my wife uh, to work in an accounting firm or whatever. She's an accountant, uh, now she's an academic herself. Uh, and so uh, I think there's increasing dual opportunities. So it's not just for the academic, I think the benefit really is to the entire family. If you can, okay. And then in terms of how to find overseas opportunities, obviously jobs.ac.uk. Uh, is a, a tremendous site and I, they're doing more and more things all the time and I think we're going to see uh, more uh, done in the future as people both have an interest in and are looking for these opportunities. There obviously are other career sites uh, that have an international section in terms of international opportunities. There are many government sites, uh, particularly where countries are wanting to build capacity where they're asking for foreign experts uh, and foreign and involvement. Uh, obviously, the groups like the World Bank, Asia Development Bank, the United Nations, there's various research institutes often doing a comparative study. Uh, we'll be looking for academics who have an expertise in that area. And of course, the benefit of the, of the internet is not so much just the technology, it's the network that one can now have <coughs> virtually internationally. Uh, and that network can be ongoing. And I think uh, eventually uh, universities will give more credit, I think, to people who have the ability to build and nurture networks is a very important component of both research and other opportunities. If we can go to the uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of a little bit of brief personal history, uh, I was going to mention a little bit about three uh, Australia 
is really uh, now virtually my home. As I said, I live and will retire uh, in Port Macquarie, and at least it's my base. I first came in 1975 as a high school teacher, fell in love with the country. It certainly was not Kansas, and, and really loved being around uh, the ocean. Uh, and now I live uh, on the on the coast, and uh, that, that has been great. Uh, I've also spent a great deal of work and time in Thailand, mostly in the research side, but uh, I'm likely to uh, look at possibly doing a teaching gig there next. And China, I've been involved with them for about 20 years, uh, starting with a research grant, but leading uh, to various things. And, and friends that I developed uh, and uh, met 20 years ago, some of them are still uh, very close friends uh, today as well, too. <clears throat> and that picture there is uh, when I was uh, lucky enough to be the first recipient of the the Global 1000 Talents program that China has uh, was the first one uh, that CUPL had, and uh, they made a big ceremony out of it. I'm there with professor, the president of CUPL, and uh, they, have, they, they have done everything to make it an absolutely wonderful experience, and uh, I couldn't say enough about uh, how great they've been. Okay, my next slide. Uh, just some photos. I think you can see it's not quite Kansas, uh, particularly on the coastline there. That's uh, uh, a shot that's virtually about 100 yards coming out from my house. Obviously, Sydney and the Opera House, well known. And then, obviously, the inland South Australia, famous for its wine uh, district. But it's uh, such a beautiful place, and I hope that you'll have that opportunity at some point. Next slide. Uh, in terms of a little bit, very briefly, about the Australian higher education system, it's mostly a public system uh, that uh, there is one now private uh, for-profit university. There's one private university, Bonn. Uh, these days, uh, a PhD is really required for almost every position, either in the entry level. Uh, they have what's called lecture A through E scale. A is under the English system, like a, a tutor position up to a, a basic lecture, senior lecture, associate professor, professor. Uh, tenure jobs are getting increasingly harder to get, uh, and I think that's true everywhere uh, with greater casualization. Research is very competitive, uh, probably more opportunity in the health and sciences generally than in areas like mine. With law, again, international linkages is not only a plus, but on many grants a requirement. Uh, Australia is very sophisticated technology-wise. Almost in every university that I know of, lectures are recorded. Uh, the it, blended learning is very much uh, uh, the requirement of the day to, uh, to both use the technology uh, as well as the, some face-to-face -face teaching or some programs are entirely online law programs, which you, I know you don't have in the U.S. Uh, quality control, uh, again, pretty formalized uh, in terms of, um, of requirements of, of unit outlines, and I think more than ever before I've seen uh, that uh, teaching is more part of a system now as opposed to every individual lecturer doing their own thing in their own classroom. And again, I think that trend is probably true most every place. All right, the next slide, thanks. Uh, in China, uh, again, a uh, very modern uh, city as well, too. Uh, and what you discover, of course, when a country as big as China is that there are many Chinas. Uh, and uh, different provinces have their own dialect, they have a common written language, but the food, the culture, uh, there, there are great differences, and I'm only, uh, you could spend a lifetime and still not know China, uh, and I'm only just barely beginning in that regard, but it's been very exciting learning a little bit about uh, one of the oldest civilizations uh, in the world. So, next slide. Okay, this next slide, please. Okay, uh, again, uh, there's uh, uh, one of the functions there at CUPL. Here, a little bit about China. Uh, China is a very centralized system. The Ministry of Education uh, tightly regulates both what universities can do uh, in terms of entrepreneurial programs, where Australia is very entrepreneurial in terms of new program development. Most appointments are centrally approved, so uh, uh, there's an experts bureau, and, and everything that I was involved with had to go basically through that. Uh, it's absolutely critical, particularly in China, I think, to have sponsorship and support uh, from, and to get to know a local university. And so really, uh, on my program, much of the running and the support uh, has been with the university on my behalf. 
uh, Chinese universities are very prestige conscious, uh, I find, uh, and uh, students uh, want to go to the highest ranked possible universities and they seem to be very brand conscious uh, where, uh, in fact, I've tried to encourage them sometimes it's not so much brand always, but it's best fit for you and sometimes the student may get a better experience uh, at a smaller university that might not be quite as highly ranked, but the program is a better fit for them. Uh, in a way, a benefit as well as a detriment. Uh, if you don't speak Chinese, like in my case, I don't expect everybody to speak English. Uh, so I'm not involved very actively in governance, although I do get input into the dean and the international office, and, and they take that very seriously. I'm involved in international linkages, particularly uh, if it's an English university, English-speaking university, but on day-to-day -day governance, not there. I'm not involved there. Class sizes compared to what I'm used to are generally a bit larger. Teaching style tends to be pretty heavily lecture, but, uh, but and, and students are having to speak in English, for whom many of them it's their second or even third language, and so a big part, I think, for me is, is getting them to have the confidence to not expect the English to be perfect, but to have a go. And it's, to me, it's exciting when the day arrives when almost every, in a three hour or two hour class, every student makes some comment during the class. And that does eventually happen. And once they get going, it's then hard to shut them up, but it makes it very, very exciting. exciting. The technology I find with the internet, at least in ours, has been a little bit patchy. Uh, language is always a challenge, but again, that's just part of it, and the need to be flexible, responsive uh, is very, very important. Thailand, very, very similar. Again, the language very, very difficult. Uh, I was in Northeast Thailand at Khan Ken University working with the uh, Research Center for Dispute Resolution. Uh, again, you increasingly find Thai faculty who have studied abroad. Uh, their uh, English, I think, is uh, you're seeing more and more of that now over a 20-year period that I've worked there as well, off and on, uh, more and more English all the time. We've had many Thai students live with our family and, and visit uh, us, uh, and uh, Thai uh, people obviously are very friendly, a very beautiful country, and there's many parts of Thailand as well, too, and those are just uh, some of the scenes from Thailand. And next. Uh, Thailand's a rapidly growing system. In contrast to China, there's a lot more private uh, universities growing there, and uh, so you get a great deal of diversity. At the same time, there is also a hierarchy of universities. Uh, there's an increasing emphasis on research. There's a tremendous need for their own faculty to uh, work on their PhD, and increasingly a foreign PhD uh, is required in China as well, too. Uh, if your PhD is not from a foreign university, I think it makes it much more difficult to get a position. There's a strong desire for international linkages, uh, and uh, they see the value in it, are hungry for it, uh, and uh, at, at the same time, it's important, I think, for academics to come to uh, be pol politically and culturally sensitive and to uh, obviously realize that uh, every country has its own strengths, uh, that uh, you have to always be conscious that what works well in one country may not work in another. Uh, there's a growing group of, of, um, of foreigners, I think, both in Thailand and every country, and, and again, it's important uh, to both network with them, but at the same time reach out and not spend all your time with them as well. As well. Uh, uh, too. Uh, language, again, can be difficult, but like all things, I think, with friendship, but particularly in a foreign country, building trust, and the more that you do that, the more, I think, both opportunities uh, open up to do all kinds of things uh, that are uh, both very, very worthwhile and very exciting. Okay, the next one. In the South Pacific, I've done a fair bit of work with the University of South Pacific uh, in uh, Suva and Nandi. Uh, both uh, working with their MBA program, uh, have been there uh, often. Uh, it's exciting because uh, the uh, University of South Pacific really uh, provides uh, courses for 12 island countries, and uh, there we use the University of Hawaii satellite system, and although I had them all together for two weeks, uh, thereafter we used the satellite network, and this was 10, 15 years ago. It was very, very exciting. And the challenge there was the island economies are so unique of adjusting what I knew uh, to really provide something that was both worthwhile and to learn more about their particular needs. And so uh, I think if you have that interest in, uh, in looking at different ways of doing things and adjusting what you know to a different environment and different setting, uh, I think that um, there's just tremendous opportunities both for learning 
uh, together uh, and trying to uh, solve uh, the challenges that, that uh, are unique to them and, that, and yet also ones that are common to everyone. Next slide. Okay, uh, that's all for me. I look forward to getting any questions from uh, you during the, um, during the question and answer period. So thanks very much and over to Mitzi. Fantastic. Thank you, Eugene. That was very informative and I think it's given everyone lots of food for thought. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Mitzi Waltz, who is an associate lecturer in autism studies uh, with Sheffield Hallam University, which, who are based in England. And she's also a contract researcher with disability studies in the Netherlands, uh, in Holland. So we've heard a little bit about Asia Pacific, so Dr. Mitz's session will now cover uh, and focus on what it's like to work in the UK and also Europe. Um, she will also provide some considerations in choosing a university overseas, uh, and we'll then sort of end on some sort of job application tips to really help you secure that global job. So over to you, Dr. Mitzi. Hello, I'm here to hopefully get you started on your way. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is moving from the U.S. to the U.K. So that'll be the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you've watched films and you've read books, you probably have quite a distinct idea already of what the United Kingdom is like, but living there will surprise you. These are views of the old and the natural, but these days it's a very modern country. Move on to the next one. The system, if you've had an idea that UK universities are all like Cambridge and Oxford, which are very traditional, you'd be surprised. They are fantastic, but they're actually hotbeds of really up-to-date research, very well-funded research, very busy international campuses. And um, one thing that we do take from that system is that lectures at UK universities tend to have quite a lot of autonomy, even now, to develop your own curriculum, which is one of the things I enjoyed the most. We don't tend to do big exam sitting outside of uh, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. We're more likely to have students doing essays, practical projects, and other kinds of assessments. And there's a lot of flexibility there, which can make it really enjoyable to teach. There is a strong history of lecturers having a big say in university governance. Um, for better or worse, that is changing a bit. But uh, at Oxford and Cambridge, still very strong. Most UK students, however, attend modern universities, not the kind of traditional universities. These are much more like the sorts of universities that you would see at the state university level in the US. That's where I used to work, um, the University of Sunderland. I can even see my window in this picture. A fantastic university in a beautiful setting, very modern, very new. Another difference between the UK system and the US, although I'm afraid this is one that is also changing, is that we don't use nearly as many adjunct or temporary staff. It's been frowned on for a long time. It's still quite controversial. But for you, as an academic, that's definitely a plus, as is research and teaching freedom, when and as you can find it. You are expected to publish and pursue grants, but still publish or perish. And uh, research excellence, uh, broadly defined, is nationally monitored through a system that you have to submit to. Um, you'll be guided in that. Moving on to mainland Europe, you've got just a wealth of opportunities. And again, very, very diverse possibilities throughout Europe, from the Western European old universities, which uh, range from the very ancient, uh, up to universities that started in the 19th century, which is relatively new by European standards, to some brand new universities, particularly in Eastern Europe. I've done lectures in Eastern Europe. I've never taught there full time, but I know there's a lot of action there, and it's well worth looking at. Next slide. Most countries, like the UK, throughout Europe, have a two-tier university system. You have a few elite research universities like Sciences Po in Paris, and you have large national universities that focus on more practical courses. Here in the Netherlands, where I work quite a bit, we have universities and we have Hochschulen, which sounds like high school. That's your normal state university kind of university that does BAs, MAs, and in some cases, some types of practically oriented PhDs. 
Higher education here is heavily subsidized, which means that students don't pay the kinds of fees that you see in the U.S., although in the U.K. our fees are higher than they are in the rest of Europe. Staff pay throughout Europe tends to be on a national scale, which is set in consultation with the main staff teaching union, so you kind of know what to expect when you go in. You don't have the freedom to uh, make big changes to the pay. You know where you fit, and you know where you're going to go, and you know what you can ask for at each level, and that's actually quite helpful. Typically, admission in mainland Europe is based on national exams, so you have a lot of student aunts at that time of year when everybody's doing their exams. The curriculum question depends on the country. Uh, in some countries, it's very rigid and centrally set. Students may have to sit a lot of set exams as they go through university to progress. In other countries, the curriculum is set more at the university level, and so when you're doing your research on where you want to go, this is one of the things you want to know about so that you can speak knowledgeably in an interview. We do have multidisciplinary courses. We do have creative assign assessments and practical assessments, but it is often true that it, it is exam-based or long essay-based. In, the, in uh, the Netherlands and some other countries, though, we do build in a lot of uh, real-world work experience, and that's one of the great parts of the system where I'm working now. There's a lot of movement of students between EU countries with the Erasmus, pro Erasmus program. Flexibility is something we're trying to build into the system now that we're more of a, a bigger thing, the EU, so that we can get students to try to go out of their home country and uh, there's a lot of time being put into that, and you might play a part. So if you want to get started, I think the thing you've got to do is figure out what your own priorities are and what your own skills and weaknesses are so that you know where you can fit. Think through what subject areas are you qualified to teach in. This isn't just what your degree is, but it may also include where you've had experience of practical work. Where are those skills in demand? Where are the places where there are a lot of jobs on offer? And that's just the kind of thing you could go on jobs.ac.uk and have a look. Who's looking for your skills? Consider your language skills. They do make a difference, even with a lot of teaching being done in English these days. If you have a second language, that can really broaden the possibilities, especially if that second language is something like French or Spanish where there are a lot of people who speak it in multiple countries, or a fantastic world language like Chinese. Think about what your motivations are. Are they career ambitions, that you want to move in a particular direction? Are they financial, because not every country pays better than where you are now? Are they about broadening your horizons and having new experiences in life? Then you've got to think, what resources do you need to make moving abroad possible? It will cost you money, but often universities, if they're hired from abroad, will provide some incentives like relocation funding. And do you know somebody, maybe someone you actually went to university with, or someone you work with currently, a former colleague, somebody who could advise you about the countries or the specific universities, or better yet, the actual post, that you're thinking about? Then I think you've got to narrow your, your plans down just a little bit. You want to think, which countries would you actually really enjoy working with? Not every country is for everyone. I can think of a few that I wouldn't particularly want to work in. Um, but there are others that I would be extremely excited to work in. You need to find a country where there are programs in your subject area, and you also want to decide for yourself from the start. Do you want to start with a temporary post? to just maybe dip your toe in the water, or are you really ready to make a full-time move? If you're interested in a temporary post, you might consider a secondment from your current post or an exchange. There are a lot of academic exchanges, and it gives you a way to just test it and see, see how it goes. Next slide. When you're choosing a university, there are a lot of tools available to help you. There are university world rankings, um, the Times in the UK 
publishes one of these every year, and it's a good one to look at. There are others you might want to look at in terms of your subject area. You probably already know certain universities that have a great reputation in the field. But you also want to think about resources and collections or co-researchers and where they're located. If you're interested in archaeology, for example, where might you be able to get access to the collection that will really make your career take off? You want to consider career advancement opportunities. They aren't the same in every country. There are places where you might be able to go and work, but you'd be unlikely to move up, and others where you might be able to move up very, very quickly. This is the kind of thing that somebody who knows that country well can give you the information you need. And then you've got to consider the cost of living and the potential additional benefits of living and working in a particular country, the language requirements that you might face, which uh, even on courses that are taught in English, sometimes language requirements are there that you have to be willing and able to learn a language within a year. I face that here in the Netherlands, and uh, I'm almost there. And uh, requirements in terms of location, if you might have to do a lot of travel, which I can imagine can certainly happen. Um, next slide. The greatest demand for English language lecturers is in the Middle East and in the developing world. So China, India, Brazil, Southeast Asia, all of the places that are building their universities from the bottom up over the last 20 years and that have massive student demand. There was a time when those students wanted to go to the US or Europe. Now they're building capacity so that that's not necessary. And in fact, they're attracting students from all over the world. There are opportunities ranging from established universities to brand new universities. Um, Qatar Education City is a great example. 80% of the staff there is American. and uh, Many of them are actually working for US or UK universities. They're not working for a Qatari university. They're working for the satellite campus of a university from another country in English. Exciting opportunities if that's something you're interested in. Next slide. You need to position yourself for your job search by not being a complete unknown. So there's some things that you can do to make sure that people know your name when that application comes across their desk. The first one is one that will help you no matter where you work, which is publishing in international journals. The second is thinking about whether your publications can be translated into other languages. That will mean that they've actually read you in their own language, which is uh, definitely an advantage. Join international research organizations in your field. This is probably the most important step. You will gain colleagues this way. They've usually got mailing lists that can hook you up with people and make you part of ongoing discussions. Very important. Attend international conferences. Don't let your current employer know that you're looking for work and that this is part of your plan. But it's important for your career no matter where you are, so just do it and make a point of getting to know people who are in the places that you would like to be and read work by lecturers at universities where you'd like to work. Look up the staff list, find out what they've written, and contact them with questions about their research. It's the best way to get academics talking to you. We all like to know someone's interested. A few important tips. Um, outside of the very, very top level of overseas academia, I mean, I'm talking vice chancellor, chancellor, dean, there isn't a lot of headhunting, so don't sit waiting for a call. You've got to actually proactively look for the posts that you want. So use sites like jobs.ac.uk. Use national websites where they're looking for experts in a particular country and be very structured and organized in your job search. Find out what you need to do with your CV, your resume and how applications tend to be done in a particular country. A lot of them are online these days, but there are formats you need to know, and uh, big cultural differences in what should go on your CV and how you present yourself. A tip I've had from colleagues who are working overseas is pay close attention to the job description. The most annoying thing that they face is getting loads of applications from people who haven't done that, who don't actually meet the criteria for the post, 
and that then get branded as a time waster. You want to only apply for those posts that you know you're a great fit for and let them know in your application all about your motivation for wanting to work overseas. Don't let them think that one up for themselves. You want them to uh, know the real reasons that you want to be there, the positive reasons, and that will be just what you need. The interview procedures at overseas universities can be really different to what you've experienced before. I actually have only worked overseas, even though I'm from the U.S. originally. It's the only place I've worked as an academic. My American colleagues have told me about these three-day interview extravaganzas that you do. It tends to be much shorter over here in Europe because they've checked you out before they offer you an interview in the first place. If you're not sure what to expect, ask a colleague at a university in that country, or just ask the HR department. They actually will tell you a lot so that you can be prepared. Get a portfolio together. Make sure you've got everything they might ask for, because you don't know if you'll have internet access. You don't know if you'll have your own computer working. Make sure you've got stuff printed out, your full research and funding experience. So if they say, well, what was your research income for the last few years? You've got it. Information about every module you've ever taught on every course or program you've ever taught on, every guest lecture session, so you're ready for every question. And um, research cultural issues in advance, so you're sure not to give offense by wearing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing. Next slide. You may need to submit your qualifications to a national organization. In Europe, we have um, different ones for each country. Your PhD may not count as a PhD in a few places, which is a bit of a worry. And I do want to caution you to watch out for scams. There are a few. There are a few websites that look very official that are not the real deal. So stick with the established sites or deal directly with universities and government departments, not people who promise to do something for you for a fee. Try to develop a little knowledge of the local language. That always sets you in good stead. Even if it's just politeness words like please and thank you, it really sets you apart from other English-speaking applicants. There are a few logistical problems, but they're all things that you can find out about. You've got to think through visas and work permits. Usually, if you're hired, the university will help you with this, not only for you, but for your partner and children. Your children's education, you may not be able to use the state system, so that can be an additional cost and an additional thing to set up. Don't forget about your partner. If you have one, their career and their life abroad is also very important if you're going to have a happy experience. Often the university will help you with this. Relocation costs, be sure to ask at interview. And in a few places, there are safety issues that you need to be aware of. And, uh, the uh, home office of the country that you're going to, the home office of the UK, for example, can help to explain to you what you need to know to make sure you stay safe in your new home. Next. I really recommend trying a temporary opportunity, like working as a visiting lecturer or doing a sabbatical overseas before you make a permanent move. It's a not so fun to make a big move with your family and find it's not for you. So give it a go on a short term and you'll know for sure that it's exactly right. If you are offered a job, be sure to check a few key issues before you sign anything. One of them is academic freedom. I know a few people who've run into difficulties around this, so you want to be sure that you're clear on what you can and can't do and that you're comfortable with the rules. Make sure that the university has a good reputation, including a good reputation for working with overseas staff. Check the facilities for research on what you expect and what you need to do the work that you do. And make sure that you're put at the right place on the pay scale, because sometimes you might sign something at a lower level than you should, unless you know exactly what the situation is, where you're going to be working. Working overseas takes you off the tenure track, and I know for those of you in the U.S., that can be a real issue. But it's only a temporary blip if you're planning to return. It can enhance your career prospects, but be sure to keep that in mind and to make sure that you do the things that are important to get right back in if you do return to the U.S. You may need to plan this quite carefully.
whatever you do, good luck with your search. I hope that uh, anyone who's got sincere plans to work abroad has an excellent time of searching and that you find just the job you're looking for. Thank you, Mitzi, and Eugene as well. Now we have a little bit of time left for a Q&A session. I'm going to pull up the questions and see what we have in order um, of how they were asked. Of course, some of them were about the sound issues, which I apologize for. <laughs> One, thanks for being patient. So a question for Professor Clark. And we touched on the language issue, so I'm going to skip that one. Okay, here's another one for Professor Clark. Does Australia recognize the Master of Fine Arts MFA terminal degree as an equal to the PhD? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, so I have to say I do not know too much about uh, fine arts, so I don't know, uh, to be honest with that, but I think uh, if the Australian uh, immigration site I know has a, um, a lot of information about recognition of foreign qualifications, and Australia does make a commitment to um, recognize as far as they can the equivalent qualification in, uh, in the U.S., so uh, I think Mitzi gave great advice there is that I would contact someone uh, in an Australian University's Fine Arts Department and uh, they will, I think, very quickly give you the answer to that question. You can often tell a lot by looking at the online CVs of lecturers who are currently working in the department that you're interested in applying to about what they're looking for. If they haven't put it in the job description, that's a good place to find out what's expected. That's great advice. Okay, here's one more for Eugene. Sorry guys, he's coming in the order that they were received here. So let me pull that one up real quick. Thank you for touching on opportunities for family, family members when working abroad. From your experience, have you experienced support from your institution for professionals with a family, or has it been a challenge? I have to say it's been a support. I mean, I think I'm helped by the fact that accounting is fairly international anyway. Uh, and, um, and I have to say as well that uh, the uh, support, particularly in Australia, was great uh, that my wife was able to uh, get an opportunity in a, one of the top accounting firms that I think uh, the same opportunity would not have been available uh, in the U.S. And so one of the things that I found uh, in uh, my international career was the opportunity of doing things at a national and international level that uh, would have been far more difficult for me to do uh, in the U.S. Those opportunities were greater uh, overseas, at least for me. But the universities that I've been involved with as a whole have been very, very helpful, very cooperative, and use their networks to assist. Great. Mitzi, would you like to add anything to that? I think um, the UK is a bit of an outlier in that trend. Um, not particularly used to two career couples, even in these days. But I know some universities are trying really hard to get up to speed. And uh, one of the advantages um, with my former partner was that he was able to do a degree um, at a very low price because I was on staff. That's always a benefit. Great. Would either of you like to speak to the climate for LGTBQ faculty overseas? Yes, I can do that. Depends absolutely on the country that you're in. Um, the UK, the Netherlands, very comfortable. I could imagine it would be rather different in the Middle East. I think it's one of those questions that you can often find out a lot by just looking at the information that the university publishes. Do they have supportive organizations and are they proclaiming that in public on their website? Um, talk to a member of staff who teaches classes that might be of interest to LGBTQ students and um, 
see if they've got advice for you about the climate where they're at. It is institution to institution, country to country, but I think there are some places you'd have an absolutely fantastic experience. I would only add, I think Australia would be a fantastic experience in that regard. Uh, Asia, probably a little bit less so, uh, and I think Missy's comments were spot on in relationship to all the others. Great. Um, one, good one good point that a couple of our attendees have made is that the HERT job seekers are not all faculty specific. Some of them are um, administrative or just working within the higher education field. Do, do you guys have any information or advice for non-faculty positions overseas? There certainly are some, especially if you know a lot about some um, university-specific ICT, e-learning, for example, a lot of posts supporting e-learning development. Um, I've also seen a lot in facilities uh, throughout Europe because we've got older buildings. There's a lot of things that need to be done to retrofit and manage these. Logistics positions in any big organization are always a big deal. And if you have international experience, that can be a real advantage. We have a lot of universities in Europe in particular that are building these satellite campuses and they're calling on experts to try to get these things to work. It's not always easy when you have students who are maybe receiving courses over web links or where you have a lot of staff traveling frequently back and forth. And I know there's got to be opportunities there and I have seen some really interesting job listings in those areas. I would predict that area is going to grow, as, as she says, that uh, I know I often get asked uh, by HR, by the international department, uh, where I've, I've been engaged uh, with, uh, with them, uh, that they are very keen to know about how things are organized in universities that I have been connected with. Uh, and I think um, foreign expertise, not just in academic areas, but all the administrative support areas, I think uh, is very, very important. Many universities are now uh, outside, they really have been impressed with the alumni model that exists in the United States. And I know in Australia, in China, uh, far, wanting to develop an expertise and a greater infrastructure to support and tap into that alumni network. So I think that across many areas, uh, that's going to be a, a possibility of uh, new opportunities. Great, thank you. So here's another general question, and I'm not sure of the best way, maybe you guys can think of a way to answer it, but we have somebody asking about a general idea of range of salaries. So maybe as they compare to the U.S. or faculty specific, I'm not sure. Would either of you be able to address that? Well, there's a British expression, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is country to country. Um, I have to say one of the nice things about working in Europe is that you can find out. It's no secret what the salary range is. If they say the post is for lecturer or senior lecturer or professor, there's a published scale and that applies to everybody. There's no secret sweeteners behind the scenes or anything like that. It's just where on that scale do you fit. The salaries in the UK are a little bit lower at the very top level than what you might be able to get in the U.S. at the top level because of that. But they're perfectly fine. I don't think anyone's hurting. Um, and because we do tend to have full-time posts that are proper jobs, not adjuncts where you're working at three different places, um, it's, you know, it's a reliable, decent income. In Europe, there are some places where the salaries are a little bit lower, and some places like France, where there are some people at, in the academic world who earn rather high salaries. So uh, it's worth looking country to country if salary and earnings are a big concern. Yeah, Australia is very uh, similar to the UK in the sense that you have uh, levels for level A, B, C, D, E, the salary scale, they may give a loading for more expensive cities like Sydney, but it's generally much the same throughout the, the country, and uh, it's pretty easy to find out that information. Uh, 
China it certainly seems to be more opaque uh, for me, uh, and again, that the salary is really determined by the pro type of program you're on in most cases. Uh, but uh, there's so much diversity, just as in the U.S., that depending on the the type and area and region of university and even faculty level, there's a huge diversity in the U.S. So it's very very difficult, I think, to to make comparisons. You just have to ask around and um, use your networks. Uh, but it is more transparent, uh, particularly in countries like Australia and the U.K. Great. There are some other advantages which um, can include you don't have to worry about your health care in a lot of European countries. It will either be covered if you're in the UK or it will be quite low cost insurance. And uh, that's certainly a nice thing when you have a family. Great. We have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to try to sift through the questions and find you know as many as I can that apply to as many people as possible. One of them is, um, is there a typical time frame for jobs in Europe, for example, when postings become available for the next academic year and when those applications are typically due? Hmm. I think most typically, if it's, if it's a new program or a program that's expanding, you'll see that in the spring for the autumn term, but um, I, see, I see listings all through the year for all the reasons that you would expect. Um, staff change jobs and programs suddenly grow or suddenly don't grow. Um, yeah, any time. And uh, they'll, they'll let you know what, what the scale is for getting your application in. There'll be a due date and it's usually pretty quick, just a few weeks. Great. Um, I guess th there's another question here specifically about Latin America, but maybe we can phrase the question as to, you know, a great starting point for our job seekers if they aren't interested in international um, work and they want to find out about other places outside of the countries that you guys presented today. Where is a good starting point for that information? I'd start with the the website of that nation, because usually they'll have sort of a roundup about what's our education system about, how does it work, what are the levels, so that'll give you an idea of how many students go to university and what levels they go to university at. You can often find backgrounders about particular countries, say if you wanted to look at Uruguay or you wanted to look at Brazil, that will tell you what are the biggest universities in those countries and what kind of universities they have because often there are different sorts, not just the two-tier system, but you may also have teachers' colleges, for instance, or agricultural colleges, or specifically engineering universities, technical universities. Um, so you should be able to find that information fairly easily these days. Beyond that, um, build that network in the countries that you're most interested in. Get to know colleagues there through their work, through their research, through meeting them at conferences, and ask them. They're the real experts. Great. I, we, I think we have, uh, we'll go over just a little bit, but there's one more question that's popped up a couple times that I'd like to ask, which is, have you guys see, seen or experienced any bias um, for or against older faculty members overseas? In China, uh, I would have to say, I think it's uh, partly the Chinese and, and maybe generally uh, Asian cultures, if one can say that. There is a high regard for age, uh, which is nice in some ways, given that I'm in my 60s, uh, that uh, they're, uh, whereas in some ways it would be a disadvantage in, in some countries. Uh, in China, I think, and I think also maybe in law, there's a, it, that's part of it as well, but I think that uh, if you are an older academic, uh, if anything, they probably give too much deference to you. Uh, and so sometimes it's, you have to really work to get students to challenge and to be more uh, assertive uh, in their learning. But, uh, so I would say there's a positive bias in China 
at least uh, in uh, the law social science area that may be less so in sciences, I don't know. But that's, that would be my response. I think there's a, there's a little bias sometimes. Um, but experience counts. And if the experience that you have is of value, I don't think it's going to count against you very much. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your, your excellent questions. Um, Eugene, would you like to share a final thought with the group? Yeah, I think it's uh, one that uh, Mitzi covered so well, and that is uh, that if you're really interested in the international opportunity uh, to persist, uh, and in a way think big but start small, and that small can be uh, getting to know uh, someone from that country, even in your own backyard. Most cities have sister city programs. Uh, and, and just knowing someone local will know a lot about the university. So s remain open to the opportunity. Start small. Maybe go there on a holiday. Get involved with someone from that country. Have an international student uh, stay with you or family or whatever. But there's so many ways uh, to at least get started. And you can think big in terms of the opportunity, but persist. And certainly for me, uh, it was a life-transforming experience that, uh, that I uh, have uh, benefited from continually. So uh, if that's in your heart to do, stay with it. There is, uh, you will be able to find and make a way. That's Great. Great. And maybe would you like to share a thought? Yeah, that's fantastic advice. I'd just like to encourage you to consider the opportunities because there are some considerable opportunities, particularly in the developing world. Any country that's right now developing their higher education system needs your expertise if you've got something to offer. And uh, those are the places with the most amazing career opportunities, although you might find one anywhere that you might want to look. Great. Well, thank you everyone again for joining us today. And thank you especially to Eugene and Mitzi for sharing your insight on this topic.